Hey everyone, this is Dan Binkin with the University of Northern Iowa's uh, Center for Business Growth and Innovation, uh, as well as our Advance Iowa program. Uh, we are committed to helping companies around the state with the uh, COVID crisis you're experiencing, doing whatever we can to help out. Uh, you can find more information about our services uh, and, and some specific COVID resources uh, on our websites at advanceiowa.com as well as uh, cbgi.uni.edu. I am joined today by the uh, man who needs no introduction, Scott Swenson with the Kirkwood SBDC. Uh, he has been the regional director for the Kirkwood Center for many years. I had the pleasure of being his colleague for a while and learning a ton from him. Um, Scott, we are grateful to have you with us today. Uh, I am excited to hear your viewpoint uh, for many reasons. First of all, uh, you have a background as a small business owner and uh, previously, was it a color tile that you owned in Cedar Falls? Maybe I got that wrong, but I know you had a flooring store. It was a floor to ceiling store, yeah. Floor to ceiling, color tile was probably the uh, enemy, I suppose. And uh, anyway, and then uh, from that, I know you also in the, uh, during the crisis of 2008 with the flooding, uh, in the Cedar Rapids market, you worked, I think, on behalf of the chamber and the city and, and other entities helping companies uh, navigate the waters of, of the loan programs and grant programs that were available at the time and being a consultant to them. Um, and now here you are as, a, as an SBDC, a Small Business Development Center director, uh, working with your clients again through the current COVID pandemic. Um, and you can find more information about Scott and about the other regional centers across the state that make up the Small Business Development Center at um, sbdciowa.org. Uh, so Scott, uh, with that, maybe first you could give us a little background on, um, uh, on what happened in 08 and, and how you were involved with that, what kinds of things were going on for business owners at that time, and, and maybe where you see parallels to now. Right. So for those that weren't familiar with the, the flood in the Cedar Rapids area, we had, a, we had an event that, that turned the downtown of Cedar Rapids into a lake. You couldn't even see the bridges as you crossed the, the interstate. We had uh, 900 businesses and a couple hundred property owners impacted by that. And a lot of the early recovery that started happening was just what the business owner network would cobble together. Frankly, there were five guys that got together around a kitchen table and started sharing their stories about uh, what they were experiencing. And they started to organize themselves from that point. So there was a period of about 18 months where uh, between the city and the various organizations trying to help out as best they could, they identified that there was need to have a more structured effort to help with the recovery. So we created a, a case management program through the Chamber of Commerce. Mission was to go out there and figure out how to be of some help with uh, those business owners. Didn't really have a, a task list, but uh, first thing we did was started collecting data about the impact. But in doing that, we started hearing about the stories that they were experiencing. And 18 months after the fact, there had been a lot of emotional buildup that had occurred. Most of the situations where that business owner felt like they had carried the, the weight of the entire company on their shoulders for that period of time. It was a financial drain, it was an emotional drain, and uh, uh, they were just, grateful to have someone to talk to and that their voice was being heard. So that was kind of the immediate feedback we got. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, some of the takeaways I got immediately was, you know, a business and an owner, their identities get intertwined and, you know, it's very personal for them. So when the, they go through a crisis like that, they're experiencing you know, they're in, a, they're in a survival mode. They're doing everything they can to, to save their business. So they were, they were trying to 
treat their employees as best they could. You know, they probably kept them on payroll when they didn't have to, but they were making sure that their pay, um, employees were well taken care of, that they were able to provide for their families. That was really their, their first priority. And then it was about the, the needs of the customers and, you know, to make sure that there was no break or minimize the impact that their customers would experience and that they would be able to return to normal uh, conditions at some point. Mm -hmm. And then there was a piece that was all about just trying to get things functional again. So they might have used credit cards, drained their personal savings, uh, used any available cash that they had to try and get that business operating again in some fashion. And frankly, that's the phase that we're in right now with a lot of these business owners. It's, we're going through the emotions of this crisis. It's not over. We're in the middle of it. Uh, emotional things like fear are, 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 are prevalent and it's uh, present in the decision-making. Yep. And uh, part of what we hope to provide with any of the resources here is a sounding board of some sort. You know, can we help with some of the decision making? Can we can we help sort out what's fact and what's feeling? Um, can we get past some of the 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 fears and concerns and start thinking about you know coming through the portal here and emerging on the other side as healthy as we possibly can to get back to business as usual. Perfect. Okay. And so in that 08 crisis, there were loan programs available. There were, I think, some maybe forgivable loans and grants and, and things like that. There were other forms of assistance that came along uh, with that. I know there was a heightened focus from the SBDCs to, to do more work. We, uh, we were set up in various locations, right. for clients where they were. Um, how do you, how do you see things now for, for business when, you know, at that point in time, it was more of a regional disaster. It was a geographic disaster. Um, what we have are facing now is, is very much, you know, global in scope and, uh, you know, with the exception of a few industries, most everybody is impacted negatively. I realize that some are, are maybe doing better, um. Not that they want to be doing better, but they maybe are, and that most most firms are really facing the wind in their face right now. What kinds of things, when you sit down with a client, are you are you talking through to kind of draw on your past experience from from '08 to help them think through what's going on now? Right. Well, one of the things you mentioned there was you know the need for capital, and oftentimes that can come in the form of loans whether it's through credit card debt or through disaster loans or through bank loans. The, the number one comment I heard from the flood was paraphrasing, but my bank saved me was a, was a common statement that when people turn back to their primary relationship and the people that they already, that already understood their business, they were helping cover things like being able to make their payroll for the, for, the, for the draw that was happening or to uh, just have some working capital. But that's before any of the grant programs started, before any of the, uh, the structured disaster programs uh, took place. It was those, those banks and those primary relationships that were, um, were the first resource just to keep things um, going. Um, one of the things I talk about often though, is with a disaster like this, a loan can be one, one piece of the pie or one tool. But if you think about a normal business loan, we're usually using those to improve our business in some way. Right. We're buying plant, we're investing in employees, we're investing in equipment. We're gonna find either additional revenues or increased efficiency as a result of that investment. So there's a return on the money that we've uh, taken out in the form of a loan. 
and it, it pays for itself. With a disaster loan, it's not the same. Um, you've taken the loan just to keep things as they were. So now the, the debt payment somewhere down the road becomes um, an additional piece of overhead. So to the extent that we can, we want it in the picture, but we want it an action of uh, last resort rather than a primary response. Perfect. And so when you're, and I agree, you know, you're thinking about that loan is typically an, an investment loan and now it's a survival loan. Right. As you work with clients now, or is it, are they able to find, you know, ways to, to I guess, uh, you know, stave off having to do that lending? What other things are they doing? I mean, I know we saw the report on unemployment skyrocket, of course. And so I'm, I'm right. guessing you're working with clients who ha who are having to go that route. Are there other things that, you know, maybe creative ways that folks are trying to uh, shift and, and, and be flexible in order to kind of use, think of loans as that last resort option right now? Right. We haven't gotten too far into loans yet, but that's looming. Um, yep. One of the things I talk through often is that when we start a business, most of the time we, we bootstrap our approach to how we start that business. You know, it, we're really creative about working with the resources that we have. We've used personal funds. We've used the cash flow of the business. We've done about everything we can to fund it through uh, means and resources that are within our control. And much like we did when we started the business, I'm a proponent of taking that mindset into the recovery process here too. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that we can totally avoid the loan, but if we can minimize it and take on less debt as a, as a result of it, all the more uh, better position to, to do this. And we're seeing a lot of the activities or the actions taken uh, that need to occur. So for some businesses, they've been mandated to close or close, you know, uh, because of market conditions. And so they have zero income. I kind of describe those as much like we put our computer in sleep mode when we walk away from it. We kind of want to do the same thing with our, our business as best we can. Preserve all the cash that we can, shut down all the expenses that we can, make sure our employees are taken care of uh, through the unemployment options or the, the new program that would be coming that into play in the, uh, in the CARES Act. Yeah. But we're doing all those things to try and uh, hold on as much cash as we can to um, come out of the, the, the crisis with as much strength as we possibly can. Um, there's also those that are going to be early impacted. Uh, I talked to a lot of businesses that are seeing their revenues down 20 to 50% where they're still going. It's probably not covering their costs. Um, and those situations, you know, we're trying to look at things that they can do to generate some additional working capital perhaps, but has the conditions of the market changed anything that we can take advantage of. So for one example, look at all the businesses that have now created curbside pickup. Yeah. I mean, that's a simple example. Many of them probably had those plans in place for some period of time. <clears throat> it would be a long-term long enhancement to their business model. It makes sense to pull the trigger on those type of things and just implement them. Same thing with a, a brick and mortar retail store that had always intended to do some e-commerce. You know, the, the crisis is forth, forcing some uh, implementation that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. So innovation's happening here. And so I hope one of the things that we come out of this with um, is some piece of the business is in better shape than it was before, that we've increased our capability maybe that we've even increased our reach with some of our, our customer base because we've kept contact with them. We've maybe done some things through 
through online channels. Uh, one of my favorite stories here was a guy I, I see in the gym as a musician and he's, he's a concert pianist. Well, he's got these, these concerts that he sells tickets to and, you know, his music sales and so forth. Mm -hmm. All those things have been shut down, but he's been doing these performances on Facebook Live and grabbing huge audiences. And to me, it's like marketing brilliance. He's going to have that much bigger a following when, um, when the concert season opens again. So taking advantage of what's there doesn't help the income stream right now, but it's building something for the future. Oh yeah, I would agree. I mean, right now we have a very, a somewhat captive online audience that, you know, these work at home folks and, and everyone who is, uh, uh, shelter in place right now, which is, I think, over half the country's population, um, you know, they're a click away from you type of thing. And how are you, how are you reaching them? Uh, the lemons in the lemonade type of thing. Are there stories that you remember from 08 that maybe are applicable either in concept or, or um, in practice now as far as things that you saw businesses do then that maybe could be uh, replicated or, or used to kind of think through, well, I remember this company did this when they were faced with this type of thing. And I just was curious if you had any anecdotal stories of success from then. I do. I do have some of those stories and um, you know, I kind of opened the, the segment here by talking about those those four guys that gathered around a kitchen table yep. and, and to me that was the most effective thing that ever happened you know there was federal assistance there were local efforts to happen but it was that peer network it was business owner helping business owner that had the most impact in everything we did in fact when we when we formed this case management program we had statistics that told us that from previous disasters, 55% of all businesses that had been flooded would be out of business within five years. So our mission was to try and improve on that. Wow. Yeah. So at the end of, at the end of our, I'm sorry, 55% would, percent would fail after two years. So at the end of the case management program, we had uh, collected those statistics and we had an 82% success rate. So if being proactive about it, uh, converting debt uh, programs into grant relief was a big piece of that. Sure. So part of the bridge was people had to get their, their, their buildings occupied again and their and the manufacturing and operations back up. They had acquired that debt but we we're able to structure some of the federal programming then as debt relief programming and to uh, get that piece of it out of the picture. Okay. Yeah, the anecdote one though, my very favorite uh, story was Raining Rose was a really successful company in, in the market. It had been located in the Nubo area severely impacted by the flooding and they make lip balm and and uh, uh, personal products and chuck hammond was the the ceo at the time still is and wonderful guy but the way he told his story was basically they had a five-year strategic plan and the flood had made the opportunity where they needed to accelerate the, the implementation timeline. So they took a five-year plan and made it a two-year plan. And <laughs> instead of sinking a bunch of money into uh, that, that building, they built an entirely new plant and they're a thriving company today. How about, um, um, they are a poster child for growth coming out of, the, of that, um, flood and recessionary time. Um, how about when you think about, you, you mentioned, you know, the bank saved me was something you heard often. I'm guessing that's 
oftentimes because these uh, business owners were being proactive with their bank. They were they weren't trying to hide. They were having conversations, get, getting the bank in the loop early on, letting them know, right? You know, this is my situation. Uh, what are my options? Type of thing. While they still had options before, you know, before they get too far down the line where they don't have any options, right? Um, right. What, um, who else, you work with a lot of clients and probably a lot more right now with, with this going on, who are you advising them to kind of have on their team, so to speak? You mentioned that in 08, you thought maybe the biggest success coming out of that was just the way that businesses started to integrate with each other and, and, and communicate uh, as owners with each other, peer-to-peer -peer learning, essentially, and uh, leaning on each other, uh, going through the process together. Who who are you advising your, uh, you know, your clients to kind of lean on now or or coalesce around and get opinion from now? Well, besides opinion, you know the the key pieces of the financial picture that we're still going through was, you know, talk to your bank, talk to your landlord, talk to your key suppliers and talk to your customers. Those are all the, the big, big chunks, plus your, your staff. So yep. those are the ones that you have to be in constant communication with. Um, you know, in, in, in our region, in fact, most regions in the state of Iowa, we've got a rich environment with economic development agencies various groups, whether they're through universities such as you and I, or our chambers of commerce, our main street districts, uh, our small business development centers, our SCORE chapters. All those organizations are um, working collaboratively here so that we can bring as much firepower um, to the front line as, as we possibly can. And there's an overwhelming need for uh, for resources right now. So we have to be pretty coordinated in how we, how we approach things. Mm -hmm. I think too, though, that some things have been designed for the early response, but getting a uniform, a unified business voice together uh, to talk about the issues, to share on some of those emotional things that they're going through, to figure out what other people have done to create some workarounds, to, to innovate, maybe to create some new opportunities. I think those, those things are hugely helpful and, uh, and a big piece of it. All right, cool. Um, our guest right now is Scott Swenson. He's a former business owner, current uh, director of the Small Business Development Center in at uh, basic Community College covering the Peter Rapids metro area. Uh, he was a integral part of flood recovery efforts in 2008 in the Cedar Rapids market when uh, when they were devastated um, and now is, is uh, facing a new round of devastation that his clients have uh, in front of them. You get, I'm sure you get clients that are coming in and just, you know, um, from an emotional standpoint, maybe not from a financial standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint, they're uh, in trouble uh any words of advice you want to you know you could pass along uh from that standpoint uh yeah that one's you know that one's invisible you know for the for the most part people are trying to be as strong externally as they possibly can so you know the fear type of things that they're experiencing is going on internally and they're you know, not trying to share that with anybody. So again, that can be family, it can be your, um, it can be your spiritual organizations, it can be other business owners, but finding a way to, um, to talk through some of those things that you're feeling is a, is a big piece of it. And in fact, you know, sometime soon here, we want to focus our efforts on what the, what the going back into the market looks like and being aggressive about capturing any pent up demand that may be uh, experienced. I know yep. a lot of people are bored being at home, 
So <laughs> even though the entertainment business has been shut down, um, you know, there's going to be some pent up demand that people are going to want to take advantage of. So really we want to go from that emotional phase into the planning phase and thinking about how we can thrive once that next, that next stage hits. Okay. So that kind of provides a sense of hope and, and uh, you know, a future spot of success for them as far as if they can think about what uh, version 2.0 of their business might look like if it has to uh, be that drastically changed or whatever it might be, but that's somewhere where they can plow some efforts, some energy and some thought right now and, and think about how do I come out of this stronger? How do I come out of this uh, more profitable, leaner, whatever it might look like for them? Is that kind of what you're talking about there, Scott? Oh, for sure. You know, right now there's this, uh, there's this um, anxious energy that a business owner has and they have to use that energy in some way. So they're doing whatever they can to try and help their business. They may be doing some short-term promotions. They may be some, trying some things. In fact, they may be trying to stay open when they shouldn't. And instead, we want to redirect that energy toward the period of thriving, not just the period of what do I do? It's how do I look ahead and think about what the conditions are going to be and now start using positive energy toward planning for a vibrant opening or a vibrant existence after we get back into the market conditions. I think that's a great point. Um, in, in a way, I think that's probably cathartic at some level to, to think about a, a new future, a new positive future for your company where how do you see that playing out? I, I think for some firms, this maybe has forced their hand to become more um, either online, virtual, whatever it might be to kind of meet the demands of, of of newer consumers, generate newer generations of consumers and that kind of thing as well. Um, you're taking calls and, and whatnot. Uh, I'm guessing hour by hour, new, new folks are coming and talking to you. And before I ask my last question, I'll just remind everyone that this is live. If, if you've got a question, please type that in uh, to the Q and A for Scott. Um, Scott, how, how have you had to work with anyone either now or in 08 that maybe um, you know, was in a pretty dire situation from a cash flow standpoint or whatever, and, uh, you know, had and, and was looking at loans as kind of this quick fix um, and maybe had to have someone ask them tough questions to help them realize that, you know, maybe that isn't the right route to go. I don't know if you have any stories like that or any advice for folks that are, that are looking at grabbing this stimulus, um, but maybe it isn't the right decision for them. Well, too, I don't want to, I don't want to divert people from the stimulus programs too. Right now they're structured as loan programs primarily. And right. At some point they're going to evolve. So there's going to be an aspect that may be forgivable at some point. There's a hugely important piece of it that being registered at the, at the federal level and being registered with the state gets people in the queue. It gets, it, gets the, it gets the government to understand the impact of what people are experiencing. They now have ways of communicating with people and we can start designing programs to better fit the situation. So even though some of the funding may not be absolutely uh, desirable or not enough money to go around, mm -hmm. um, it's still beneficial to be in the system so that future iterations can uh, um, be communicated and passed along. That's a great point. Uh, apply even if you don't end up taking it type of a thing. Yep. Okay. You know, the, the CARES Act, a big piece of that is intended to go through the SBA uh, commercial banking system. Think about the how broadly that can help the implementation versus, you know, a direct loan going through a, a disaster center. There's a whole lot of horsepower out there in the banking community. Uh, the banks understand the people that are sitting across the, the desk from them. I mean, there's going to be a, or through the vir virtual means. Yep. Yep. Feet away. Yep. yep. 
but they get to leverage those relationships. And to me, that's going to be a much more powerful way to uh, uh, get funding into the, into the, into the pipeline. Perfect. All right. Um, if, if you're joining us a little late, our guest is Scott Swenson, the D director of the uh, Small Business Development Center at Kirkwood Community College. He's a former business owner and a, um, uh, someone who did a lot of triage and had their hands dirty during the 08 floods in the Cedar Rapids at Market, uh, helping businesses come back from that. Scott, this has been great. I really appreciate your insights here from what you know, what you've uh, experienced and what you're kind of telling your clients now. Um, in your opinion, this CARES Act then, you know, a lot of it does look like loans up front. I don't know if you remember, is that what 08 looked like too? And then they were able to get creative and some of that got forgiven based on, you know, the how a, how a company used that funding and things like that. Is that similar to what you think will happen this time around? I don't know what to expect this time around, but in 08, uh, there were federal disaster loans. They, those had been in place and those were, uh, between that and bank loans, those were sort of the two primary ways that that initial band of funding hit the market. And then later, uh, Congress had appropriated 85 million for uh, disaster recovery in the state of Iowa. And so there was a pool of funds that ended up getting designed into programs that helped with rent assistance, that helped with equipment purchases, uh, helped with some, uh, some, some building repairs with uh, flood insurance and other things. Yeah. Because those funds were going into, into replacing some costs, those building owner or those business owners were able to uh, retire some of the debt that they had and, and basically trade some of the grant dollars into uh, uh, debt relief. Okay, I do kind of remember some of that. You know, there was yeah. some of that money used even to uh, offset rent costs for, for businesses and, yeah. and it got to a point where it was uh, able to be uh, repurposed even into like facade improvements, right. and structural improved buildings and things like that. So kind of the bottom line here as we wrap up, but uh, apply, get applied, get your name on the radar. If you don't know how to apply, uh, you can talk to Scott. You can go to the Iowa SBDC.org. You can go to advanceiowa.com. Um, talk to any of us directly. Um, I think I might have one question here. Um, let's see here. I was just, I'm just going to read this one quick as we're live here. It says, the Iowa grant program asked for a P&L and income for the first quarter. The deadline was noon today. My business was okay until last week but that's not clearly reflected in our financials. The money I requested was a projection of what I will need help with. Um, is that the best approach? So I don't know, Scott, if you can see this question in the Q&A there, but you know, basically doing that uh, projection work, I think, she, I think Mandy is on the right path here with what she's done, um, showcasing kind of the, the new normal within her uh, projections. So, right. Right, Scott. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, you know, I'm a spreadsheet guy, but I kind of want to illustrate what happened the first three months of the year. And here's what we had coming in for revenues. Here's some detail on the experiences that we have during normal times: our rent, our payroll, uh, our cost of goods sold, all that kind of stuff. And then we've got what are our projections for the next six months that being April through September. And there's gonna be a gap there between the income that we're bringing in and the expenses that are gonna continue. Well, that's the economic impact that some of the programs are gonna be based on. And so some working capital programs will address that. Um, the, the federal disaster loan that's currently structured is really gonna look at six months worth of operating expenses and calculate an award based on the rent and payroll and so forth. So kind of want to have something that's good for you to make your decisions about your business, but simple enough to communicate with these funding application, what's going on with your business. Mm -hmm. 
getting a handle on your on your monthly uh, expense structure, at least the fixed side of things. Yep. And focusing there first. Yep. And uh, not so much concern about the profits uh, or some concern with the P and L, but a lot of it is concern uh, with the expense side of things as far as what are those fixed expenses that you've got. Yeah, the programs that are out there so far relate to payroll, relate to unemployment, relate to operating expenses. Our biggest impact is on the top line being the revenue. So the difference between the two is going to be where we're going to uh, have the greatest impact. But if we can cover some of those overhead costs, that'll help a lot. Perfect. Well, Scott, I thank you for joining us today. I thank you for your words of wisdom. Any, anything you want to leave us with as we end here? Oh, just that, uh, you know, to use that entrepreneurial mindset that grew the business to the state it, it, it has enjoyed. Use that entrepreneurial mindset to take you through the crisis and really take you through to the other end of it. And, um, you know, you'll be somewhat back in startup mode or, you know, getting back up to full speed. So the same thinking that got you started, use it to help you with the, uh, with the process throughout. Perfect. I've got a lot more faith in the entrepreneur than I do in the assistance programs that are going to not cover, you know, the kind of revenue impact that we're seeing out there. Yep. Absolutely. Rely on the strengths that got you where you are now type of thing. Yep. Um, so thank you to Scott. I, uh, I want to give a quick mention that we've got a couple of webinars coming up tomorrow as well. Um, talking with the CEO of Fairway Grocery Stores, Reynolds Kramer. He'll be sharing uh, some things about what their company is doing right now to meet customer demand at a time when they are seeing uh, crazy demand for their, uh, for their services, of course, and also how are they focusing on, on their employees and employee safety at the same time. Um, and then the afternoon session, we're gonna be focused on what I hope will be, will, people will think of as the, the positive side of this, the opportunity side of this is, is now that our customers are all at home, how do we reach them? Uh, that'll be our two o'clock uh, portion of things. Uh, how, do we, how do we keep in touch with those customers that are no longer coming in or, or how do we reach out to new ones uh, now that we maybe have a little better idea on where they are right now? So uh, with that, I, I wanna say thank you again to Scott for joining us, it's a pleasure having him on and uh, if you can uh, if you can make time to join us uh, again tomorrow that'd be great please come with your questions good luck with to all of you with your businesses uh, remember that we are all resources here to help either at uh, UNI uh, or the Iowa SBDC system uh, thank you for your time take care